Hi, and welcome to another episode of Talking About Teaching Economics. My guest today is Avi Cohen, professor at both University of Toronto and York University in Toronto. Hi, Avi. Thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure, Jason. <laughs> So um, what we're going to talk about today is a little bit different than some of the narrower episodes I've done where we're talking about a specific topic. I, I want to have a conversation with you about a totally different approach you're involved with in, in delivering introductory level courses. And I and it's known as the literacy targeted approach, if I got that correct. Right. Um, can you explain this literacy targeted approach and, and what it is and and how we may begin to wrestle with it? Absolutely. The literacy targeted approach is motivated by some really amazing and shocking, at least they were to me, statistics. Okay. Uh, and that if you look at both Canada and the US, at least 80% of the students who take principles of economics, and that's mm -hmm. always been my lifelong love teaching, 80% of those students never take another economics course. Mm -hmm. And of principal students, the numbers who go on to major in economics, it depends on whether it's a college or a university, mm -hmm. but the, the numbers range between like two and 6% go on to become majors. That fact, um, coupled with an observation I've had, and you've probably had this experience too, where you tell people you're a professor of economics, and if they don't ask you about the stock market, then the next thing they're going to do is say, oh, if this is if they're older. Um, Oh, yeah, I took economics, and it was an awful course. And so many of us put our hearts and souls into this. So what is it that makes that an awful course? And mm -hmm. I think the problem is, is that so much of what has traditionally been an introductory course has a whole set of principles, isn't quite the right word, but a whole set of techniques and models mm -hmm. that were required to do to cover the curriculum uh, we don't think about how relevant those are to the students in our course. We think of them as potential majors mm -hmm. and, oh, they're going to need this in intermediate theory and you don't want them to be ill-prepared. But for most of the students, there is no intermediate theory. And yeah. unless you hook them with something that's really relevant to them, that they can see is relevant to their lives, you're never going to catch them. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think about a, a business, you know, if, if you're a business and 80% of your first time customers didn't return, my God, you'd be bankrupt, you know, instantly. <laughs> so the idea behind the literacy targeted approach is that um, it's important to include in that first year course things that will be relevant and applicable to most students for the rest of their lives. And so what does that actually look like? Yeah. Right, we're 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 changing our target. I mean, we're not we're not just trying to recreate ourselves anymore. It's not that reproductive drive. Right. Um it's something else. So what 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 is that? So what makes what makes a course literacy targeted versus not literacy targeted? Okay. So they're both Exclusions and inclusions. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me start with the exclusions. That sure. what I exclude, which will shock a lot of people, um, <laughs> and then talk about what that then allows you to include. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in microeconomics, absolutely we do a lot of supply and demand. I don't do any utility maximization at all okay. because you can develop a demand curve and talk about. You you know, marginal benefit versus marginal cost. Mm -hmm. um, in elasticity, the only thing I think that's important as a measurement is percentage change in quantity, percentage change in price. The midpoint formula is not going to be relevant to people's lives, <laughs> whether it's on the demand side or the supply yeah. side. Um, cross elasticities and income elasticities are important because mm -hmm. they help students understand how we try and measure things like substitutes and complements and what happens when income goes up and, and income goes down. I guess the biggest omission, I don't do perfect competition as a market okay. structure. Uh, students mostly find it, what's this? You know, I don't know anything in the world that looks like this, but most importantly, um, all of the issues in competition, you can blend together. For any business, it's mm. marginal revenue versus marginal cost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, no matter what your marginal yeah. revenue curve looks like, it's still going to be marginal revenue versus marginal cost. 
So I do not do any cost curves. I motivate the supply curve very early on in a chapter mm -hmm. on supply where I, I have a small business person who produces, uh, Paula produces tattoos and piercings. Okay. And she has employees who are not equally skilled at both. And so if she wants to move from more of one to the other, you get a concave production possibilities frontier right. and you get increasing opportunity costs. Yeah. And I don't need a diminishing returns example. I don't need, I mean, I do that later on, but but I don't sure. need any of that. So uh, I, I won't go on too much longer, but I, I'll tell mm. you what, to me, the most important difference is when I taught micro in a traditional way for 30 plus years, I often said to students when I had up on the board, you know, here is um, the cost curve diagram with the long run average cost and then the short run average cost scalloped underneath it. And right. then here we have the market demand and supply. And then in the end, you end up at that minimum point on the long run average cost curve. And that's where the efficiency comes from. And why is that the most important diagram? I don't know if you agree with that, but um, for me, the reason it's the most important diagram is that it's what's behind Adam Smith's invisible hand. You know, why is it that markets produce the products and services we need when we need them? And the answer is, is and the way that I tell the story anyway, is that, well, if there are economic profits, Businesses mm -hmm. will come into an industry, okay. supply increases, price falls until you get back to that magic point. And if there are economic losses, it works in reverse. Mm -hmm. But I can do that just with demand and supply diagrams. Yeah, uh, I, I can show that to you if you want. <laughs> if, you, um, if you like. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued. I've been playing with some of these. I, one of the things that I was intrigued by when I started to delve into what you've written about this stuff is, um, because I come at this from an andragogy point of view, that was my early exposure to thinking about learning and thinking about setting up courses rather than pedagogy. Um, and there are so some differences. Can you can you explain that for me? So it's it, it has to do with um, a very old uh, adult ed instructor who was my mother, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the distinction between andragogy and pedagogy is pedagogy tends to put the instructor at the center. Mm -hmm. And andragogy puts the student at the center in okay. a very interesting way. And so I was intrigued that there's a number of parallels in in how you describe thinking about course design from a literacy targeted perspective and how I've sort of done it, pulling from a lot of this um, maybe archaic, I don't know. Um, it's it's student-centered is very modern right <laughs> well but um i encountered this stuff like 40 years ago <laughs> and it was drummed into my skull at a tender age um mostly in part because i was not a great uh public school student and, and getting into trouble a fair bit but um so one of the so i, I wanted to riff on some of the things that that show up and talking about this and how do you one of the things that seems a parallel to me, and I've come across it in different places, but for economics, one of the most notable, I would say, is Schiller, and talking about narrative economics and mm -hmm. the idea of narrative driving this forward. Is that is that a fair parallel in your opinion? Or? Uh, it's totally a fair parallel. I, I, I have to say, I, I love Schiller and his work, et cetera. That's a terrible book. Um, <laughs> I, I remember talking to David Colander before he died. Um, and he was he was commissioned to write a book review, uh, I think, for the Journal of Economic Literature. Right. And uh, his dilemma was he always wants to praise Schiller, but it was a terrible book. Um, <laughs> so let me switch to the other sure. huge advocate of the narrative approach, which is Robert Frank. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's been doing this for a long, long, long time. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, it's based on this idea, and maybe this is the Andrew Gaji thing as well, that, you know, humans absorb information through stories, mm -hmm. you know, that's what gets us, you know, that's oh, why yeah. if you don't like a movie or if you, it, it, when you're learning something new, you have to figure out a way to relate it to your own experience. Mm -hmm. And usually a story will help. I, I, mm -hmm. I remember all the years I taught before I was doing anything literacy targeted, um, in the middle of a lecture hall, I would talk, I would introduce a concept, whatever, you know, elasticity. And then I'd say, 
let me tell you a story about this. Mm -hmm. and you could feel the class relax. Like yeah. even just those words said, oh, okay, I can listen to this. Mm -hmm. It's not somebody droning on, um, of course, none of us drone about, um, you know, detailed concepts that they can't quite locate or connect to their own experience. But it's just a form of delivery that is mm. um, very human, very, mm -hmm. very human. The person I love to quote on this is Ariel Rubenstein, the game theorist. Mm -hmm. And and you've seen, uh, I refer to his, his work in my in my own papers, but he he has this wonderful analogy of um, economics, just like um, telling fables, whether it's, yep. you know, King Solomon or Harry Potter. And, you know, when we build a model, it's a simplified version. It's just like yeah. a fable. And his, his punchline is economic theory spins tales and calls them models. Yeah. Well, that's all a model is, is a story. I mean, and it put me... Yeah into uh, the mind of some of my own experience and growing up in, in really small remote communities um, of some of the indigenous people and the elders floating around and, and the way um, I, I don't want to step too far out of my own box here, but there, there is something in the way that a lot of those stories get told and the way lessons are imparted from elders mm -hmm. to, to, uh, you know, people who are <laughs> in need of some assistance, I guess, is that's always how I encountered them anyway. Um, and and so, yeah, that storytelling is very natural, very human. And, and we are, we tend to absorb those a little easier. And I think that's an important mm. point not to get lost. And you're, and you're, and you're grounding about uh, Robert Frank. I've, I've always enjoyed his, his approach and his ideas as well. And I'm pleased to see him turning up as part of this sort of stream of thinking about how to do what we're doing. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of people who are in the stream, but it, it's a lot like, you know, the uh, Moliere's character, I forget who, you know, who's trying to become an aristocrat oh. and realizes he's been speaking prose without realizing it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because he just didn't know the term for it. And, yeah. you know, this whole literacy targeted approach, I think shares so much with many, many good teachers who mm -hmm. don't necessarily identify with this specific approach everybody yeah. does something like this in their teaching if they're a good teacher yeah, well and that was one of the things that I, I was you've given me a set of labels and and well and also a different structure on which to to sort of hang things um in in reading your work and 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 that's what i found really interesting is like oh okay that fits with this and it sort of let me unpack my own approach a little bit more which was i, I found quite interesting um, one of the other terms while we're talking about them or labels for lack of a better <laughs> term is this backward design piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had my own frustrations with colleagues and, and administrators in trying to talk about course design. Um, and I do this sort of naturally in, in part from my own training and in, in, in experimental and with a little bit of game theory. You do uh, backwards design naturally? Yeah, it's sort of. It's I started, <laughs> you know, what what do I want? Yeah. Right. Well, how do I get there? You know, and then, and then again, I was, I was really quite tickled to see that turn up and, and uh, understand, but I think we should, I, what I wanted to ask you is, can you explain what that is and why it might be important for, for people who don't quite know what we're on about? Yeah. So backwards design has been, it's mostly a 21st century uh, terminology. Uh, Wiggins, McTie are the names most closely associated with, uh, and also uh, D. Fink. Um, I came across this when I did a teaching workshop at University of Toronto on course design. Um, okay. And um, one of the things that was shocking about it was how different it was from how I thought about course design, because oh, really? certainly starting as a young assistant professor, mm you know, you're at sea, you grab onto what you can to start. And so right. you take somebody else's course outline yeah. with a certain set of <laughs> chapters or a certain set of readings, mm -hmm. and that becomes the basis for how you're going to teach the course. Right. And um, the point of backwards design is that that is all wrong. <laughs> that you need to know, as you were saying, where do you want the students to end up before you start structuring the course, what yeah. is it that you really want them to get out of the course? Mm -hmm. And that's where there's an intersection with this 
80 percent of the students who will never take it again right so the answer to that question of what do you want students to get out of the principal's course is different if you're taking that perspective mm -hmm. than if you're saying oh well like we're going to do a traditional majors course like we've always done right so you decide what do you want the students not and, and this is also a crucial distinction which you've read it's not just what you want the students to know it's mm -hmm. mostly about what you want the students to be able to do with that knowledge yeah because that's what a university education is all about, right? It's teaching you how to think in a way that you can tackle problems in the world around you and mm -hmm. make sense of them and make the world a better place and all that. So what do you want your students to be able to do? Right. right. And then from that, the second stage in backward design is, okay, and this is about data, whether it's experiments or otherwise, is that how will you know as an instructor whether you've achieved that objective? How do that you was, measure? <laughs> that was going to be one of my big questions. <laughs> to, to, to do those things. And it's also really important for the students mm -hmm. to get feedback on their performance. And Absolutely. If they're doing it right or what course correction should they make if they're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. um, so you start with the objectives. What do you want them to know and to be able to do? Then you get to the assessments. And the last thing is, okay, what's the content <laughs> that you're going <laughs> to teach them <laughs> that will bring them right. to that final uh, era area? And one of the things I found striking about it was, you know, in the economics education community, you know, we have spent decades and time on, you know, like active learning and metacognition mm -hmm. exercises and group, you know, all these experiments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those are part of what Wiggins McTie, the backward design people, considered the last stage, the least important stage. Well, not least important, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, but the, those things don't have any coherence unless they're tied to a specific objective mm. of what do you want the students to be able to do right so i think that that brings up uh, one of the big issues um but what you've cut out well what do you do with the extra time you've cut all we talked about cutting a bunch of stuff yeah yeah, yeah. um and we talked to, we've hinted at i think what some of the things you do leave in so what do you do with the you obviously you're you're gaining time by cutting topics yeah 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 um what do you do with that time okay so uh i'll just preface this by saying that this was pre-ai and now okay. i'm being forced to completely rethink right that. but if you cast your mind back <laughs> three or four <laughs> years yeah. um in all the literature um, and a lot of this in economics goes back to Hansen from Wisconsin, who mm -hmm. was the one who had this whole idea of competencies and, and things that students should be able to do. This was in the 90s. Uh, it was tied very closely to the WAC movement, the writing across the curriculum movement, mm -hmm. because you can't tell what students are able to do unless you have them do something. Mm -hmm. You know, answering questions on a test, certainly multiple choice questions, mostly t tests what they know. Yeah. Now, when the, when we write good multiple choice questions and we all try and do that, you're still forcing them to try and use some skills that they have to apply in order to get to the answer mm -hmm. in the multiple choice question. But mostly multiple choice questions are best at tackling what do you know. It, it's yeah, testing it's testing knowledge. I, I use the distinction knowledge versus understanding. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I came across in, in researching this literature is there's so many knowledge versus understanding, theory versus practice. Um yeah. Yeah. We, we have all sorts of different uh and uh, they're not antonyms, but baskets that we, we yeah for these kinds of things. So um uh this started, I guess, back in 19. Gosh, early 90s, I was an assistant professor and I took a critical skills workshop um, in, oh. at York in the summer, mostly taught by writing instructors. And um, uh, they pointed out when people complain about bad student writing, <laughs> that oftentimes the students are present presenting or giving the professor exactly what they asked for because you don't ask an argumentative question um oh. and you say oh discuss and so they'll say oh there's this and there's this but good papers have an argument 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's the es and that's the essence of thinking is like, okay, what's my argument? What are the counter arguments? Why is mine superior to that? So I transformed a history of thought course, which is my area, um, to make everything argumentative and, and not in a nasty way. No, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, but, yeah. So the first thing I realized is that for most undergraduates, just having them say, all right, make an argument. They freak out, you know, like, who am I to make an original argument about something like that? So the first task was show them what a good argument looks like. Mm. Um, I'm going to skip to what I do in the principles course. Mm -hmm. So what I do, their first writing assignment, and this is in a course with 800 students. So we can talk about the logistics <laughs> of that too. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I designed this with a writing instructor at U of T. Like there mm -hmm. was all sorts of competency she had that I didn't have. So um, the students have to take one of 10 economist articles that I pick. Okay. Because that's the, the paragon of good writing. Um, and write a 300 word abstract. And we walk them, the instructor and the writing instructor, and I, we walk them through this with videos, with handouts, you know, about how you first how to read critically mm -hmm. um, and see what the structure is of, of the ideas um, and then paring it down to a, that limited number of words. An abstract is not a summary in chronological order because what you have to do is say, what's the main point? Mm -hmm. And then what you include is what's relevant to supporting the main point or addressing mm -hmm. the counter arguments to the main point. So, right. so they had to write this uh, 300 word abstract. Um, and then we used um, peer assessments um, software, right. peer scholar. So everybody's would submit their first draft and would be distributed anonymously to three of their peers who would have to give feedback, which they got marks for. Uh, then the students would have to rewrite. That was the other thing I learned from the writers. All mm. writing is rewriting. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, my the, I blame my mother for this. She was a, a high school English teacher in uh, on where was it on Danforth for a while. Uh -huh. uh, Danforth Tech, I think it was. Yeah, and yeah, that that was that was one of the things that got beaten into my my impressionable young skull. No, again, good for her. Um, and <laughs> and the writing instructor put me on to this um, in, this um, English professor named John Bean, and he okay. this is he has this wonderful statement. He said, "A C paper is just an A paper turned in too soon." Oh, I like that. Isn't that good? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So there has to be rewriting. So they have that ex that exercise with the. Um, Economist article, very low stakes. I think it was like 6% of their course. Okay. Um, then they had to write, this is over a full year, micro macro, oh, a okay. 500 word op-ed, one in micro and one in macro. Oh, neat. And again, it's too much to ask just to make an argument from scratch. So what mm -hmm. I allowed to do to, was to take anything that appeared in the press in the you know most recent time, um, and um, they could riff off of it, okay. you know, like, so they could support that uh, uh, that article's position or go against it, it opposite, but it yeah. gave them some, something to work with. Um, yeah. You, you got to give them some, yeah, some leverage or starting point. Yeah. Some scaffolding. Uh, yeah. yeah. Great term. Yeah. 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 That's the writing term that I learned. Okay. Too. <laughs> I've learned so much from writing people. I got to tell you. Um, um yeah. So, and those were worth, uh, I forget, like 10% each, something like that. Again, okay. the whole peer review thing. Um, and then what I would also do is that I would use those kinds of articles in short answer problems. Um, okay. Because at U of T, there's great TA support, lots mm. and lots of PhD students who can mark things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, there's all I do also a lot of multiple choice, you know, with 800 students. Um, you, yeah, you do have limited resources. You do have limited resources. That's right. That's right. And speaking of limited resources, one last point about the writing assignments. And again, mm -hmm. it's crucial what I learned from the writing instructor. 
we developed very detailed rubrics mm-hmm. for marketing, which you know all about from your mother <laughs> and elsewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and um, and the students had the rubrics in advance, so they knew what we were going to be looking yeah, for. Yeah, why? Why? I don't understand. Sorry, this is my uh, my aside. My go for my it. Brad, why would you hide the rubric from students? Yeah. Why, why, why are you trying to sneak up on the students? I don't, I don't get that. Yeah. Well, no, again, it's, it's a question of, uh, are you trying to foster their learning or are you just trying to evaluate them and mm. come up with a distribution? Um, okay. Yeah. okay. That will have I, I might answer that question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hadn't thought of, I hadn't thought of, no, I'm just trying to, yeah, come up with a, dist- I hadn't thought of that angle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but 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 the um the whole idea of writing and analyzing um stuff that they see all around them mm-hmm. is what's to me really important for those eighty percent of the students. Yeah. You know, like uh, I structure my whole macro half of the course uh, around what I call the fundamental macroeconomic question, which I cast as if left alone by government. How quickly do markets mm-hmm. adjust to provide steady growth and living standards, full employment, and stable prices? And most of economists can be divided into two camps very, mm-hmm. very broadly. You know, government hands on because the markets fail often, or government hands off because, you know, markets do a pretty good job and governments will do even worse. Right. Um, so any topic can be looked at as an argument, mm-hmm. you know, which position? makes most sense to you here what are the arguments pro and con yeah what are the costs and what are the benefits i mean yeah it's a, yeah it's it's a, i mean it, it's so principles are so simple it's 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 cost mm-hmm. benefit. like that's it, it, it micro, yeah, I, 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 yeah and what for micro i always tell them it can be summed up in five characters m c equal m b <laughs> yeah <laughs> right? that's it that's, that's the whole it. course that's and right just gonna... i have i have what i call the three keys for smart choices Okay. And key number one is really the important one. Choose only when marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost. Yeah. And keys two and three are just elaborations. Make sure you only count at the margin. Right. And be sure you count all costs, including implicit costs and externalities. Yeah. Those are, those are great. You can do all of micro with that. Pretty. Yeah. I can. You can. I'm trying to think what you can, I can't cut. No, you're right. I can. I'm trying to, well, you got you, it. You think about it. And if you figure it out, let me know because I'd be interested. I, I, yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a. I don't think there's a missing spot. Just yeah, you got to count all of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know that's understandable to first year students. Yeah, and it's something that they apply to their lives. Uh, I right. I love it, and I'm sure you have this experience too, where students come up and say, "Oh, you know, sir." You know, I just realized that what you said in class is true or it made sense to me, you know, like like yeah. I, I do the when I talk about sunk costs, I talk about, you know, how, you know, you you get on the bus, you've paid your fare and a friend shows up in a nice car with a good sound system and says, I'll give you a ride. You know, do you stay on the bus because you paid the fare or do you take the ride? With this, <laughs> you know, and a lot of people will stay on the bus. Right. Yeah. And I used to be that way too until I learned this principle. <laughs> oh, I paid money. I better stick it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I think uh, to be fair to the idea, um, I do have some a little more maybe critical or, or probing questions to yeah, please, to, please try and kick this around. So one of the concerns in talking to some of my colleagues here about it was it's shifting a lot of the technical learning. The, the building their development of technique to intermediate. And coupled with that question, I, I, I believe I read you, you radically reduced the number of graphs you use. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Um, well, anyway, let's, I'll accept that statement for the moment. <laughs> okay. Provisionally. Um, yeah. So let's split that into, so there's a, a, a movement of when learning has to happen yeah. for the majors. Yeah. Okay. And if they're performing well, that's fine. They can do it. But if they're not, yeah, you, you find, you might find something out later that you didn't find out before. Yeah. Um, and then with graphs, I've always viewed that as one of the more portable skill sets 
from an intro course. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do those one at a time. Sure. Because they're both really important questions. So on the technical side, now, what's it like at your university? Do students have to take a calculus linear algebra course before they take intermediate? No, unfortunately. Okay. Much much to my chagrin. Yeah. Okay. So that's a different ballgame. That's mm -hmm. a because at York and at U of T, students have to take the, uh, that full year of math and get a minimum grade of like 63% mm -hmm. before they can go on. So that, that's where most of the technical skills are tested. Um, not right. the specific economic ones, but, you know, optimization is the same yeah. in math or in nice. economics. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Uh, one of the things that I was very pleased and relieved to discover when we did this study at U of T, mm -hmm. um, you know, 13,000 students over 11 years, those who had taken my course without the heavy math and graphs, and those that had taken the, you know, killer intro 101, 102, <laughs> <laughs> when the those of my students who did go on to become majors did just as well in mm -hmm. intermediate micro, intermediate macro, and statistics. So since they had less of the technical from me, they must have gained something more in terms of that thought process and mm -hmm. that application and all of that. Um, Sorry, can I inter interrupt yeah, for one a technical question? So um, when I read one of the the you know how do they do studies? It was it wasn't yours. It was I looked at that one as well. Mike um, at UNCC. Yeah, UNC. Uh, UNC no, North Carolina UNC, Chapel Hill. Ch Chapel Hill. That was the one. Um, I noticed that there was a difference in the required grade to go on in the Chapel Hill study. Was that the same as in yours, or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and so, that's an important point. Okay. Yeah. Um. So at U of T, um, uh, if you took the core macro intro sequence you needed a uh, 67 percent okay to be eligible to go on in my course they needed an 80 percent oh, wow. in order to be eligible to go on mm -hmm. so there is yeah so that, that's a really important fact right yeah so the fact that my students did just as well well i had a better cut at least of my distribution of students than right they, of their distribution of students which I found in the, the, to give you your due on that, there was a, seemed to be, at least in the Chapel Hill study, just because I read that more recently, it's fresher in my mind, a bigger chunk that went on. In that, in, at Chapel Hill. Yeah. Uh, of, of, of those who took the, the uh, literacy targeted approach. See, I, I think I'm remembering this correctly. A larger, it wasn't statistically significant but it was a bigger proportion who continued on to do more economics who took at least one other econ yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. i'm trying to give you guys your due as well i mean and, and that is the idea um i, I don't have the data for my I, students I, on that. I'd have to um, look um but um the idea is we could attract a lot more students mm -hmm. <laughs> and pass them forward to our colleagues in upper level courses, and we have enrollment issues now, um, <laughs> don't we all? Um, yep. Scarcity rules. <laughs> um, that this would allow more, it would bring more students into the pipeline mm -hmm. and get them interested. Yeah. I, I certainly have um, this experience, which is a mixed experience where students say to me, oh, you know, I never thought I was going to be interested in economics. I really love the way you teach this course. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on. And then I say, I'm thrilled. But you have to know that when you go on, those courses are not going to be like this course. No, this is different. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't want to, you know, sucker punch, you know, like uh, it's like lost leader, right? Yeah. Uh, you can have this one on sale, but you're going to get caught when you... <laughs> <laughs> Give you the first one for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that does bring up my next question about the studies uh, on performance later. Is I didn't notice any real controls for instructor effects. Yeah. So in and, mine, there okay. were no controls because I was the only instructor. Sure. 
right <laughs> right <laughs> right I, and then that would be because i mean we you know looking at teaching evaluation studies and all the you know this there's a huge literature out there on a bunch of these different things and just having an impassioned instructor yeah really changes the experience for a lot of students yeah no no it does um and and that's a, a, a point to which I have no response yeah. in terms of and the and, control and again to be to be really fair it's but it's true of any of anything you put in as a treatment um the person doing the treatment is going to be yeah very Other concerned than... about what's happening yeah right <laughs> otherwise they wouldn't bother <laughs> right so yeah, yeah that, it, it that's just, fair. just just in fairness to my U of T colleagues um U of T one of the things I love about it is that they take teaching so seriously Good. Um, uh, that the people who teach the majors intro sequence are really good, passionate teachers. Good. Uh, there's well, that, more, that, that, more variety that's... of them, but um, yeah. Yeah. No, and that, that wasn't meant to be a shot at anybody. No, I, I, know, I, know, I know how you meant it. Yeah. I know how you meant yeah. it. Um, so one of the concerns I had in, in the, the, particularly with the writing driven assessments mm -hmm. um <clears throat> at number of universities I've taught at over the years, we get a lot of EFL students who are mm -hmm. drawn to economics right. in some part because of it's less writing intensive. Yep. Right. And it's, and it's a little more for a lot of them, they find it a little more objective. Yep. Um, is that, is that something you've wrestled with in this or? Um. Because I know you made a point about diversity and attracting yep. different types of students. I'd worry about losing that other side of the diversity point. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a couple of responses. One is um, the writing is, you know, so in, in my writing was about a quarter, 25% of the grade. Okay. Which is still 25% more than if you have none. <laughs> <laughs> um Fair. I learned also from the writing instructors um, in marking writing because okay. I have TAs who are, are marking these things and they're not English professors and some of them have English as a second language. Mm -hmm. um, so the rubric itself is very crucial okay. to begin with. And the other thing that we do and all people do who do this kind of thing is if you have multiple TAs marking, what about consistency? Mm. So what we do is we have what's called a calibration session where I choose uh, like five different papers of various qualities, including with language skill issues. Mm -hmm. We sit around a table, everybody marks independently, and then we go around and ask for what they scored. And then okay. there's a discussion. Uh, and the discussion is not to say somebody was right or wrong, but to move mm. towards some sort of relative consensus. Yeah. For the writing, the, the concept I learned was uh, uh, and Andrea Williams, who was the writing professor, uh, called it writing with an accent. She said, oh, okay. when That's you're talking to somebody for whom English is not a first language and they have an accent, it it's, you know, it sounds odd to you, but you can understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. The accent doesn't get in the way uh, too much. Uh, and the same right. thing happens in writing. You know, so there are um, certain characteristics that uh, people from Asia have in terms of how mm. they write, and you don't mark them down because it's not the way English is taught in Canada. Right. Uh, so okay. you really want to focus, which is the idea, on the argument. Right. So Focusing is there a structure on the rhetoric, yeah. to the yeah. to the essay or through the paragraphs? Are they in a logical order? Is there a topic sentence for each one? Do you address the counter argument? You know, those aren't so much about language. Mm. And, and in fact, in the mark for all these writing assignments, the writing quality is worth, I don't know, five to 10%. Oh, wow. It's, okay. It's so mostly about little. argument, counter argument, structure, the paragraph. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is really interesting, and 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 we're wrestling with some of these big issues, and and you clearly thought about them. Um, one of the questions I had is, do you think it's scalable without the resource and support that you have available? Um, yeah, 
Well, this is where AI may be a blessing as opposed to a curse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you can be sure that the students have written what it is that you're trying to mark. Right. Um, uh, Train yeah. an AI to mark it. That's an... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, my That's colleagues at uh, U of T use um, a discussion software called Packback. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, they, I'm going to read. They come around and try and sell. Um, and it's a really interesting product because it uses AI to evaluate discussion posts. Oh. And according to my colleagues, oh. it does a reasonable job. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. that's neat. Um, but scalability is, is a huge issue, Jason. It, yeah. It's really a huge issue. Because I was trying to figure out, like I, I was enamored with some of these ideas, but I don't have, um, I don't have graduate students at all, so yeah. I don't have graduate student TAs. Yeah, I have. I occasionally get special cases, but yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not able to draw on that same resource. Yeah, yeah. Do you, um, does Regina do um, undergraduate TAs at all? Yeah, we have undergraduate TAs, but I they're highly variable in quality. Okay. Right. Or in it, I that's a poor turn of phrase. Uh, mm -hmm. their skill sets are different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like someone who's just taken who's who's just starting third year as a TA is different from someone who's in their final semester. Right. 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 Yeah. I, I asked because I had this experience early on. Um I taught at U of T part-time like 20 years ago when I had two kids in university and I was moonlighting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and U of T has separate campuses. There's a Scarborough campus and a, mm -hmm. a Mississauga campus. And I was at the Mississauga campus and graduate students wouldn't go there. <laughs> so <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> they had a well-developed program of undergraduate TAs. Now mm. they had such a large pool that they could be really selective. Yeah. And, and, and so I had nothing but fabulous undergraduate TAs. I have had TAs that I would, undergraduate TAs here that I would trade six MA students for one of them. Yeah. But I've also had some that just, that they're not there. That's, yeah. Not, yeah. They're not able to do this. Yeah. And then, you know, that's not a shot at them as a person. It's just, no, like, no, yeah, no. It's just, you're not, they, you're not there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just for you and your colleagues, um, there's this special issue of the Journal of Economic Education that's coming out. It's the next mm -hmm. issue. And it's uh, a symposium that I organized with a couple of other people um, called What Should Go Into the Only Economics Course Students yeah. Will Ever Take. But one of the papers is all about assessments and how to generate assessments that, mm -hmm. that, that assess ability to do. And right. they're very sensitive to scale. So I think there'll be some mm. good ideas in there. Uh, about yeah, that. I'll, I'll be looking for that. I mean, one of the things I'd pass on to you to try, I do this with upper level students when they're writing papers, um, is I do a media style interview with them. Uh-huh. So tell me. They're the, so they're the expert. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm, I'm the reporter who knows nothing. I'm going to ask you a bunch of good, and to watch that change how they write from draft draft one which uh -huh. they submit to me and the final draft and they had to do this interview with me in between and they yeah you can see it changes how they're thinking a little bit yeah yeah no 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 and, that's and, good and it's There's, kind of fun. Um, um at uh ubc okanagua julia julian picole he has um an article in the jee -E a couple of years ago where he paired with a news outlet in Kelowna. Right. Um, for students being able to write op-eds that would be published. And they had, yeah. they actually got the newspaper to interact with them. And it was a similar kind of experience where they realize, oh my goodness, what are the things <laughs> I have to worry about? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It really, it really does change. Um, a little deeper question that occurred to me in looking at the, the more writing, um, the less technique heavy sort of approach is and I was thinking about this being replicated uh, across the discipline, across the universities, doing things more verbally and and with less focus on technique opens the door to more normative, subjective 
occasionally dogmatic um, things to slip slip in, or maybe it's just a different set of dogmatism um, to come through, right? Do you have you any elaborate a little bit? Well, I mean, when we're when I'm talking when I'm teaching you an economic model, yeah, right. Um, this is the model. This is, you know, this is what it says. I can test you on what does this model say? Right. Right. And it, that's and you, very and how you manipulate it. Right. And, and I can do that without really engaging with, and maybe this is sleight of hand and a little greasy, um, without really engaging with what I think about the model. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I, I, think I'd be harder pressed to do it without the model as it exists being front and center. And I'm, I'm concerned. One of my concerns is getting away from, and I see this in other disciplines, you do get dogmatism slipping in mm -hmm. as lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And it tends to, in my experience, limited as it might be, tends yeah. to be more prominent in the 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 disciplines that draw on a, a stronger humanities yeah, tradition. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I I I'm totally in agreement with that. That's my experience as well. Yeah. Okay. So moving in this direction, which to me seems leveraging some of the some of the advantages of the humanities, quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, opens the door to that problem as well yeah um yeah so this is a trade it's of course it's a trade-off issue yeah, sure. um, so as you said you know you can teach a model without necessarily agreeing with it mm -hmm. so the students learn how to manipulate that model mm -hmm. and that's an important skill but they have never they have no idea of whether oh is that the best model is there a different model that might make more sense or do a better job of addressing the mm -hmm. policy issues that they're interested in? Um, you, you see, once you stick to, here's the model and show me how you understand it and manipulate it, mm -hmm. um, it, it leaves a pretty, well, not it's unfair, but a drier set of questions. Well, it, 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 it is reduced set of questions. And it, and it, makes it harder and this is the part that i actually really enjoy doing with students is what are the limits mm -hmm. yep. of the model like where where does the model break down how do we yeah what would cause the model to break yeah and and that's no so no no and that's me. that's that's absolutely crucial um mm -hmm. and, and i do that even without as much graphing to techniques you know mm. so you could do purchasing power parity well but what are all the limitations right uh, measuring gdp what are all the limitations right Employment uh, unemployment figures what are all yeah no i mm. do all that stuff too because you want them to be skeptical and to understand yeah. the limitations uh, of of what they see yeah um i understand the fear of let me say dogmatism for lack sure of I, I, yeah i was but wrestling one with of the things that. um that uh i do in macro is that on any of these contentious issues i present these two points of view each as sympathetically as I can. Mm -hmm. Like I don't come down and tell them this is the way it is. You know, <laughs> as I, economists disagree, politicians disagree. Oh, yeah. You as citizens are going to have to take a position on these things. Mm -hmm. And we I'm just to trying to give them a framework mm -hmm. for understanding those issues. Yeah. So that they can put it in some sort of more manageable um, perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I, it's but often, it's you know I've certainly had stories from students and I've had professors you know like tell the professor what he or she wants and you'll mm -hmm. get an A right yeah which is one of the reasons why I've been quietly campaigning for macro courses particular to to be team taught ah uh huh where you can you know you could take one one you know government should be hands on and I, and or we can swap halfway through the semester to really confuse the students. Right. Uh, Right. And I've, I've team taught other courses, which is entertaining if, if you've got the right. Partner. If you get the right fit. No, I think for macro, that makes so much sense. Is mm -hmm. your intermediate macro uh, one semester, two semesters? So we've got two sort of intermediate levels that right. are one semester each. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it, it's one of those things. Um, I've taken a ton of your time. I, I want to give you sort of the last word. Um, 
what advice would you give to a young instructor um, looking to sort of dabble in the literacy targeted approach, maybe because they're not sold yet or because they don't have that freedom yet to, to mm-hmm. really take the plunge? What advice would you give someone just starting out considering using some or, or a lot of these techniques? Um, I can answer that question, but it might be self-serving. Um, so I mentioned... We, we are economists here. Okay, right, right. right. Self-interest <laughs> is okay, right? <laughs> um, uh, this special issue of the Journal of Economic of Ed- Education, mm-hmm. I think is a really good place to start. There are six different papers. Mine gives the history of mm-hmm. this approach and shows one application. Um, There's a paper showing all the data about the percentage, you know, what students do and don't take economics. As I mentioned, there's one on assessment. Mm -hmm. There's another one about how you could use the literacy targeted approach to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, there's a couple more, Um, but it's, it's a very, you know, in one place, uh, to start. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you very much. My guest today has been Abby Cohen of York university and university of Toronto. Thank you, Jason. It's been a pleasure. (laughs) Take care. Bye. Bye.